This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey guys, this is Tho Bishop, co-host of Radio Rothbard. I want to thank you for being a listener of the Human Action Podcast. We've been looking at the numbers. Our podcast traffic has been going through the roof. Our podcasts have now become one of our biggest sources of traffic for Mises content. So thank you guys for listening. Wanted to give you a heads up. Next week, we will be doing our fall fundraising campaign. Uh, this is one kind of two week long campaigns we do every year. And every dollar that we get helps go to our mission of promoting Austrian economics, freedom and peace and all of the great scholarship, popular articles and content like this. If you want to help us in our campaign, you can do so next week by going to Mises.org slash HH5. That's Mises.org HH5. There'll be a link below. And with your $5 monthly donation, you'll get a free copy of Anatomy of the State by Mary Rothbard. Obviously a classic work by his. Great for yourself, great for friends. Uh, but more importantly, you will become a very important sustaining member of the Mises Institute. So again, think of this as a Wikipedia pop-up blog uh, asking you for money. I know, I know the economy is not doing great in the last few years, but still, if you care about this cause, if you care about the work of the Institute, hope you will consider donating next week during our fall campaign. You can click the link at below. Uh, get, be a early on that campaign and you can get your copy of Anatomy of the State. Now, on for Bob Murphy and the Human Action Podcast. David, welcome to the Human Action Podcast. Thanks, Bob. So the reason I have you on here, as you know, but I'm letting the audience in on it, is that we are uh, discussing, you had a, in your Substack. stack, uh, column, you, you had a response to Brad DeLong and he had a whole piece on America. What he's saying is America has no industrial policy and, uh, just the history behind that. Like uh, I was, a, a, you know, a little kid when some of these events were going down and, and these debates among economists he's referring to, but it just doesn't sound right to me at all. And that's yeah. part of the response you gave. So maybe I'll just turn it over to you if you want to just kind of give your big picture take, and then maybe I'll, I'll bring up some specifics from DeLong's article that uh, you can pontificate on. Right. So I'll try to give the, the elevator pitch, as they say. Brad DeLong, who is a professor of economics at Berkeley, wrote a piece on his substack in which he claimed we don't have an industrial policy and we need one. But then he just made up a lot of history on two things, the history of economic thought and, and kind of history of economics. And so he talked about how, it, and he used the term neoliberal. And as I said in my piece, I know only one economist who calls himself a neoliberal, and that's Scott Sumner, my co-blogger. I've never heard anyone else self-reference self as a neoliberal. So right away, that makes one wonder, especially when he doesn't name any of them. And so he manages to talk about what neoliberals thought without naming a single neoliberal. That's where he gets the history of thought kind of weird. And then he gets the history weird because he talks about how these ostriches at the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. so there's a little hint. He's probably thinking Milton Friedman, George Stigler, Gary Becker, people like that, all Nobel Prize winners. The ostriches at the University of Chicago obviously they had their heads buried in the sand. That's why he called them ostriches. And they didn't notice that when we had an economic boom from the 50s through the 70s or early 70s, that that was not a laissez-faire economy. And so anyway, that's, that's basically his argument. He did grant, there was one major argument against inter industrial policy, which Char Charlie Schultz made. He was President Carter's uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, and he made it in a Brookings article, which I remember from the time, because I read it at the time, 1983, in which he basically made a Hayekian argument without mentioning Hayek, 
which is mm-hmm. fine. He yeah. just basically said the government doesn't have the information. They need to plan to plan industrial policy and have it work. And he made a public choice argument. He said, without again, without using the term, that they have an incentive, government officials have an incentive to do pork barrel things. And, and so anyway, Brad DeLong said, that's a good argument. Good for him. Right. But then right at the end of the article, he says, so we need to figure out how to show Charlie Schultz is wrong. It doesn't say how we're going to do that, but that's what he says, because we badly need an industrial policy. And why do we need an industrial policy? Because we're threatened from, by Russia and China on the defense side. Uh, we've got global warming, which is going to be bad. And there was one other, which yeah, I Yeah, well, I'll, I'll get to those in a minute. I ha- yeah, yeah, I had that pulled up. But why don't we, okay. David, uh, maybe for the benefit of the listener, and also, you know, we're going to be beating up DeLong for this whole episode. Let's at least... <laughs> Quote him in his own words. So here, folks, uh, I'll read three paragraphs. The first one is like the the summary, and, and they did, you know, so yes, I think DeLong had it on his Substack, but also this was run at the the website for Project Syndicate, right? So this is, you know, a, a Dave right. is not just picking on you know something that the guy wrote in his diary or something. Right. This was you know headlined and trumpeted out for the world to see. So um, the so like the sort of summary of the whole article that maybe editors wrote says this, and then I'll read the first two paragraphs of you know DeLong writing. So the summary says, when the U.S. economy ran aground in the late 1970s, the arguments for neoliberalism won out over the arguments for pursuing an activist industrial policy. Yet even if one remains convinced of the previous generation's case against government-led development, industrial policy has become unavoidable. Okay, so that's what the thesis of this essay yeah. is. Yes. And then just to give a sense of DeLong's tone and, you know, and the, like the history of, here's, you know, I was there in the trenches and here's what you folks need to know about what happened back in the day. And he says, by the end of the 1970s, the U.S. economy appeared to be in serious trouble. Years of inflation had caused deep discontent. Measured productivity growth had fallen from its post-World War II pace of 2% per year to almost zero. And America's resilience in the face of geopolitical and geoeconomic shocks seemed to be waning. The proposed solutions to these problems fell into two categories, neoliberalism and activist industrial policy. The neoliberals won. All right, let me just give you one more, folks, so you can see the tone here. Neoliberalism called for shrinking the state, deregulating as much as possible, curtailing antitrust enforcement, and accepting higher economic inequality as a reasonable price to pay to reinvigorate private enterprise and motivate, quote, job creators. The central assumption was that markets would always deliver better outcomes than government programs could. Yet the consensus today is that this approach failed spectacularly. So I take it you disagree with that on just about every front. Do you want to? Yes, almost every front. Uh, So in other words, it isn't the case that they shifted over to complete deregulation and so on, but the deregulation they did do worked spectacularly. The deregulation of airlines, which brought down airfares, inflation adjusted. Can you you speak to that? Because I think, you know, like people might, like I don't, even though I may have been alive for some of that, like I didn't, you know, remember I would have been a toddler. Can you just explain like what what the regulation was and what the effects were when they deregulated? Yes. The Civil Aeronautics Board was started in 1938. And in order to get a route between, say, San Francisco and Chicago, you had to apply for a route and your your competitors already on that route could come in and object. So they often did. So sometimes you'd get the route, sometimes you didn't. Also, if you wanted to change a fare, either up or down, you had to give 30 days notice And again, during that 30 days, your competitors could object. And guess what? If your plan was to cut the fare, they often did object. And so an economist at Cornell University who written kind of one of the Bibles on regulation named Alfred Kahn, people call him Fred, came in under Carter as chairman of the Civil Aeronautics Board and used what discretion he had to deregulate. So in other words, there was nothing stopping him from granting a route. There was nothing stopping him from allowing someone to cut fares. So he did that. But then Ted Kennedy, of all people, uh, pushed for deregulation. So it was a kind of a, a bipartisan move to deregulate. And so a bill was passed in 1978 to do that. Between 1938 and 1978, there was not a single new national airline allowed in the business. After that, all kinds of airlines entered. People Express, Texas International, and so on. Southwest Airlines, which had started in Texas between three cities, Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio. And so they knew how to work in a deregulated environment. It was not interstate 
so they weren't regulated by the Silver Aeronautics Board. They figured out how to do that, and then they expanded and did well, as did PSA, Pacific Southwest Airlines in California, which had existed just within California. So that was just a spectacular achievement. I remember before deregulation took hold, it was 1980, and a friend of mine died at University of Rochester, where, where I just taught. And I checked airfares to go back for her funeral. And my pay at the time was 20000 a year. And the round-trip airfare was $800 in 1980 dollars. And it would wipe out three or four years of, three or four months of my discretionary income. And, mm -hmm. and I unfortunately told her, her lover, they were not married, but her lover, I told, I just, I just can't do it, you know? So mm -hmm. that just shows just how much things have changed. Right. And that's partly too, just to help people connect with it. When you see some of those old glamour shots of, you know, people all dressed up and going on the airplanes and the stewardesses are giving them sumptuous feasts and stuff. I mean, that, that was part of it, right? Because the, the price competition was restricted. That's how they had to, you know, compete with each other. That's right. And actually the main, the main way they competed was frequency. So there was this famous Delta jingle in the early seventies are you ready for a song? I know you love singing. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Delta is ready when you are. And so the idea was we'll have, you know, frequent flights. And the way my professor of transportation, George Hilton, uh, economics of transportation, George Hilton put it at, at uh, UCLA when I was a graduate student in 73, he said, so what you got with regulation was airlines flying around half full with nice meals and, and, and someone playing a piano. There was actually a flight from on a on a 747 from by United from Chicago to LA in which they had a a grand piano and someone playing it. So that was they Wow, that's amazing. I've never heard that part. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. amazing. Right. Okay. Yeah. So so yeah, so the point being and now here it's, can you try to be as objective as I, I know you that's probably why I wanted I you because you are objective, I but I mean could could any economist possibly think that it's an open question as to whether the de you know in other words what the advocates of deregulating the airlines said if we do it this is what's going to happen is it possible that blew up in their face in any way or is it like no they said you know bring fares down yes less frills but you know that's what you were expecting yeah, and that's what the I think I think I'm objective and I would say no it, it worked very well and let me give you one little instance mm -hmm. a lot of us especially as I got wealthier I wanted a little more legroom Mm -hmm. An American uh, for a year or two tried giving more leg room and then they reversed because people weren't willing to pay that extra yeah. 50 bucks. So now I do get more leg room by paying the extra 50 to 75 bucks in that section of the airplane where they have right. that. But most people don't because they just don't value it that much. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. So that, that's, again, why I, I just knew that I wasn't trusting his, his history here because it's, yeah. uh, I had never heard anyone and, and I, and just folks to, to pace yourselves. I am going to circle back David at the end. Like, I think there are some examples of quote, neoliberal reforms in other countries and things that maybe we can talk about. And like that there, I'm more open-minded if someone wants to say neoliberalism, you know, yeah. wreak havoc upon the world, but well, in terms of what he's relates, talking about. I'm yeah, that relates to the other thing he said, where he said that we, he wouldn't call us free market economists. Can't do that, but I right. will. We free market economists said government, free markets are always better. And I just, maybe Murray Rothbard said that once, although even there I doubt it. But I never did. Uh, Friedman never did. Stigler never did. That, that's a, All you need is one counterexample. And how many of us are willing to say, we've looked at the world enough that, we've, that there are zero counterexamples. And so, no, it, it, that's why... He, he, he tried to make his case by exaggerating tremendously. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah, I think you're right. Murray Rothbard would certainly. And he would say, even if there was a case where it went the other, still the principle of the matter, like, you know, government intervention is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Another obvious example. And what's interesting too, with these things, like you're saying, they're bipartisan, like the rollback of Nixon's uh, oil price controls. You know, that like that's uh, my if I remember it, it started under Carter and then Reagan yes. kind of finished it, right? Like the yes. they'd like swapped a windfall profits tax or something instead you of the explicit it, controls. It's actually a graduated excise tax, not a windfall profits tax. But yeah, but what the when they when Congress passed that in nineteen eighty with very substantial excise taxes on it, it gave the president the authority to end the price controls at any time. 
over the next nine so, months. Can, David, sorry, we, we're kind of jumping. Can you just remind people wh what price controls are we talking about? Oh, okay. did some Democrat put in price controls <laughs> and, and, and take us off the gold standard? Because you know how those yeah, Democrats yeah. are, you know, soft money types. <laughs> yeah, this Democrat named Richard Nixon. <laughs> on a Sunday, I remember it. I was in the bathtub with the radio in the other room, August 15th, 1971, and announced economy, an economy-wide freeze on all prices, including all wages, for 90 days. And then relaxed it. There was phase that was phase one. Then there was phase two, phase three A, phase three B, phase four. Over the next few years, the real mess was in oil and gasoline because in the fall of seventy three, OPEC got powerful and raised the price of a barrel of oil from three dollars a barrel to eleven dollars a barrel over a few months. The price controls did not allow that price to go up all the way to the world price. And that's when the, the government started allocating to various companies. They wouldn't allow the retail price of gasoline to go up. And we got this mess. We got lines from time to time and so on. That was the mess. Car, uh, Ford kept those controls. Carter finally made a trade. He'll have very high excise taxes on oil in return for gradually getting rid of price controls. And then Reagan in his first two weeks in office, I think, looked at the fact that he had discretion and said, this is crazy. I'm getting rid of the controls today. In fact, I remember the energy account, the, the secretary of energy was a former dentist from uh, North Carolina named Edwards. He'd been governor, I think, of North Carolina. And he'd already, as we used to say in Washington when I was there, he'd already gone native. In other words, he was already listening to people who liked the bureaucracy. So people at the Department of Energy said, no, no, this is a little more complicated. So when, when Edwards went to the cabinet council meeting to make his case, he said, Mr. President, my, my people tell me it's a little more complicated. And Reagan said, well, it better not be too complicated, Jim, because I'm planning to get rid of price controls tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, and, and so that too is, uh, by the way, folks, I'll link to, uh, this is some, you may remember this, David, because I think I let you read an earlier draft. When I was, when I first went to Texas Tech, that was the first big project I worked on was, because right. it's kind of, you know, cynical wisdom in our circles to say, oh, there's nothing as permanent as a temporary government program. Yeah. And so I was saying, if you had just told me in a vacuum that they brought in price controls on crude oil and had all kinds of allocation measure. I would have thought that's going to be here forever. They're never going to be able to get rid of that. And yet they did get rid of it. And so let, let's study that and see how, how is that possible in terms of yeah. public choice and whatnot, because maybe we should stop, you know, always being defeatist and thinking, no, once they get their foot in the door, it can't get rid of it. Right. And so I, and so I'll link to that folks. It's kind of a neat little, it, and there was just all kind like, it was classic. They, they had all sorts of uh, exceptions like, oh, well, because they wanted to encourage just folks to understand some of the context here. Like I said, as David said, the, the world price of crude shot up dramatically. Yeah. And so they were like, oh, well, let's protect American motorists from that. And so if there yeah. were people, d domestic old oil, like, you know, oil fields in the U.S. that had already been pumping in 1969, they shouldn't just get this windfall. And so you're not allowed to raise your prices. You got to sell to domestic refiners. But they didn't want to cripple the, you know, bringing online of new sources of oil. So they were allowed to charge more. And there was all these games about a given barrel of crude. How much could you charge for it? Yeah. Well, you had to know where did it come from or whatever. And then they would yeah. just like sell it among themselves in a daisy chain and keep raising the price like a dollar a barrel or something until anyway, it was just crazy stuff. Um, but my, my, where I'm going before that, before that trans, um, that tangent, David was there too. That was sort of a bipartisan thing. And I would have thought the consensus among not ideological, but just standard economists was, yeah, that kind of, you know, that worked. It's not like gasoline went way up in price and then no, you know, poor people couldn't drive anymore until 1988. That's not what happened. Right. And in fact, when, when Reagan got rid of the price controls, people were predicting some of those things, although not mainly economists predicting them. But what happened, see, what happened was those price controls discouraged domestic production. So once he got rid of them, there was an increase in domestic production, which really undercut OPEC's strength. And so sure enough, the world price of oil fell. There was a lag, but it fell. And, uh, you know, I remember, I remember Reagan bragging. I couldn't find it, by the way, when I was writing something some time ago. But I still remember it when he was in a, giving a speech and he bragged, it's really neat when you go to the gas pump to see the gallons going up faster than the dollars. Because for a while, the price <laughs> right. of gasoline was under a buck a gallon. Yeah. 
<laughs> just, you know, you've mentioned him a little bit here. Do you want to take this time? Like, how was he? Did you, how much did you interact with him personally? Zero. Uh, okay. I met him when he was governor. Mm -hmm. And then I met him when he was ex president. And, and when he was ex president, I had a more of a background. I'd been a senior economist in his, in his, at his Council of Economic Advisors. So we talked for about 15 minutes in his office in Century City. But no, the, the time I would have had to interact, um, there were people in the White House who were trying to punish my boss, Marty Feldstein, for okay. advocating tax increases. So every year, you're supposed to go to the White House and get your picture taken with the economic report of the president, into which I had some input, as did your friend Paul Krugman. And, <laughs> and you know, you get a picture of the whole group with the president, and if you're lucky, one by one. And we were punished because of Marty, so we didn't get that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... The, you know, the two main, main th is it fair to say those were the two biggies in terms of like there was a debate among economists and then going from the 70s into the 80s and the new Reagan revolution? Well, the other, biggie, of, there mm -hmm. were two, two other biggies. One was uh, railroad and trucking deregulation. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Interstate Commerce Commission, which had existed for decades, that was ripe also. And uh, again, it was started under Carter. And they deregulated somewhat within their discretion. And then they actually had a bill to deregulate. And by the way, there was a revival of railroads because of that, because railroads were so hemmed in. So the ICC tended to keep trucking prices high, but they tended to keep railroad prices low. And so when, when you got deregulation, railroads could make serious money and we got uh, we got very vigorous competition under by by just by a few railroads. By the way, it wasn't like mm -hmm. many. Uh, and trucking, we got lots of entry. And by the way, one of the other little side benefits was, if you look at the racial composition of truckers of, of truck trucking company owners, they were disproportionately white. And then when we got deregulation, there were a lot of black people who who ended up starting small trucking companies. Mm -hmm. Which you'd think Brad DeLong would like. Yeah. So, <laughs> and okay, well, he might have even liked. I, I just, and I'm not going to yeah. psychologize. I don't know him. We've talked on the phone once in mm -hmm. my life. I don't know him, but I just think there's been this shift in his, in him, and I'm not sure why. Okay. I mean, the same token, too. Like a lot of people lament that, hey, the late 90s Krugman was great on like trade and stuff like that. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, when he would do broadsides against Robert Reich, like it was some good stuff. It was. Um, okay. Did, did you hit the two or was there another one when you said the, the biggies of deregulation in oh, that era? When he said in that quote you, you read out that we were willing to accept an increase in inequality. Maybe we were willing to accept an increase in equality, but we didn't have to. In other words, it mm -hmm. wasn't we, or at least it wasn't clear to any of people I talked to, and I was one of them starting in the late seventies as a as a bona fide economist. I got my PhD in nineteen seventy six. I wasn't thinking, oh, this will lead to an increase in inequality. And just think mm -hmm. of the trucking story I just told, or think of the fact that with uh, prices of air of air with airfares coming down. Uh, you're going to have, that's going to be a bigger benefit as a percent of income to someone in those days making 15 grand a year versus someone in those days making a hundred grand a year. So there's just all kinds of ways where it's really a stretch to say this would lead to increased inequality. Okay. Um, is it possible he's, DeLong is kind of conflating two different things? Cause I mean, there also was, you know, big thing when Reagan first came in where the Kemp Roth tax cuts and, yeah. you know, that was a big deal and there's like some mythology there and you know yeah. there's lore that you know some of which is not true in terms of people telling us what happened in the the big bad 80s but is it you know there too was it was there like was it was it the same group of economists i mean because there is a sense in which delong's not crazy here i mean there it was that the you know the dominant keynesian orthodoxy and then there was a sense right in which lucas and friedman you know blew up the phillips curve or at least like the crude version of it and then yes. There was a sort of revolution, and there were massive, you know, this like Jude Winiski and those guys, you know, there were massive tax rate reductions. So is he wrong for thinking that the, the you know, what he's calling the neoliberals did win some kind of debate or you know, policy argument? Well, so it's interesting that you raise a good point because it's interesting he literally doesn't talk about tax policy, and mm -hmm. I would have expected him to. And 
I think he could have made a better case. I don't think it's a good case. He could have made a better case maybe that after tax inequality rose because marginal tax rates were brought down at every level, but you're bringing them down under Reagan from 70 to 50, and then from 50 to 28, you can imagine how much that would increase after tax income for fairly high income people. But he doesn't make, and and again, I don't care so much about inequality if everyone's better off and pretty much everyone was better off, but he doesn't try to make that case. I'm not sure why. Okay. um, Maybe let's, if you don't mind, David, let, let, let's try to steel man this and, and switch to a different like type of what he could mean by a neoliberal that people think, oh, is a failure. Right. And then I want to circle back to the three things where he's saying, okay, you know, given his history, take it or leave it. Now DeLong is saying going forward, this is what I should do. So why don't we save that right. part for the end? But right now, couldn't somebody say, um, oh no, what, what I mean when I talk about neoliberalism, I mean things like, like when the Soviet Union fell, and the Harvard boys went in and they were advising, I mean, whatever came out of that was not good. And if that's what neoliberalism or if that's what it means to modernize and go capitalism, I'm not for that. Or when some South American government gets into trouble and the IMF comes in and gives them a loan, but says, you got to, you know, relax your currency controls. You got to jack up taxes. You got to cut your spending on seniors and do all this stuff. And then that, you know, the people are flipping cars and whatever, because the austerity measures you know, that's what some people mean by neoliberalism. So anyway, is there any sense in which some of that stuff under that banner that, yep, we're from, you know, the Western trained economists and we're here to help and they end up making, you know, destroying the country or maybe destroying uh, the wrong word. Again, yeah. uh, so if you think about um, that guy, Andre Schliefer, who had mm-hmm. that big scandal at Harvard uh, and what they did in Russia, I mean, I got to say by that, I'm not willing to say beyond what I know. And I don't know how well that worked out in Russia. I do think go before February, 2022, when since then everything's Russia in Russia has been horrible. But before that, I still think it was the case that almost everyone was better off than they were under communism. I mean, you just, you know, you just look at what they had versus what they could have under communism and you could actually buy a car that worked, you know? So I don't know enough about what they did. He, but again, we. You say it's steel manning, but it's like it's not steel manning as much as making it up. I mean, he <laughs> literally didn't talk about that. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but ju- but just to, um, I guess partly why I'm doing it is because I think some people reading DeLong's article could agree. Yeah, I don't like what people nowadays mean by neoliberalism, but it's just what DeLong is doing. He's kind of hijacking that emotional baggage that people might have uh, against things like, yeah, the IMF or the ah. World Bank coming in and doing some package of, quote, you know, neoliberal reforms. That and could then, explain why yeah. he used the term. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Because, so, I mean, that I, is a dirty word. Just like, you know, neocon is a bad yeah. word and people are running from it and saying no one self-identifies as a neocon anymore. Yeah. That That's kind of what neoliberal is to progressives. Yeah. Now, I will say my friend John Goodman, I think you probably know him or yep. know of him, the mm-hmm. health economist, emailed me and said, I don't mind if people call me a neoliberal. And I said, John, you don't mind, but do you call yourself a neoliberal? And he goes, no, right. but I don't right. mind. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So anyway, I'm just saying it could be a, one could think it's a similar thing, like just because some neo people we would like. If Bill Crystal comes out and says, I'm not a neocon, I don't even know what that word means. What are you talking yeah. about? I was like, yeah. well, whatever it is that you guys who wanted to invade Iraq call yourselves, that's what <laughs> yeah, we're talking right. about. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so maybe, yeah, w- why don't we switch then to his specifics? Uh, oops, where is it here? Okay. So, well, I know, why don't we, I'll let you go on that because I know the first one, he was talking about climate change. And it was funny as he was lauding. Al Gore for being so prescient when I know there are quotes from Al Gore about we have until this date to do such and such. And it's long since blown past that. So to me, it's ironic to, you know, to hold up Al Gore as the canary in the coal mine on climate change, that if only we had listened to him. But so that that's one of his 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 main things. Like, why do we need and again, he's calling it industrial policy, which surprised me because I I thought that that was you know, that the, the most economists would do nowadays would be something like, well, if there's a negative externality, you got a tax or whatever. But industrial policy sounds like there's a bunch of guys sitting around in D.C. planning, we want this industrial sector to grow by X percent or we need to, you know, yeah. let this one f- shrink on the vine. And that, anyway, that's just so much 
it's so similar to central planning. I was kind of surprised that he, but nope, he's coming out in favor of industrial policy. Yeah, he is. He is. Without, so, and, and to, in a way, to his credit, since you were talking about Stu Manning, to his credit, admitting that he doesn't have a good argument for it. Right, right. right. Because the bottom line is we've got to, how do we prove Charlie Schultz wrong? In other words, yeah. we haven't yet. <laughs> okay, I, I had to use the control left to find it. Here we go. So I'll just read this one paragraph because he yeah. hits all three of his things and then I'll let, you know, we can go through them. Yeah. So he says, now, however, the United States has three overwhelming reasons. So the, the rhetorical thing is he was the longest thing. I didn't agree that the neoliberals should have won, but even if you think they were right back in the late 70s, they're clearly wrong today. These neoliberals who, you know, recoil against uh, industrial policy, and here's right. why. Now, however, the United States has three overwhelming reasons to go all in on industrial policy. First, there is the looming disaster of r runaway global warming, which requires action on a scale much larger than Al Gore correctly called for nearly a half century ago. Second, there is the need to reorient the U.S. economy from coastal finance and plutocracy to middle and working class prosperity nationwide. And third, Chinese President Xi Jinping announced a no limits partnership with Russian President Vladimir Putin just before the latter launched his full scale invasion of Ukraine. Since then, it has been clear that we are undergoing a historic geopolitical and geoeconomic transition in which, as Adam Smith wrote in The Wealth of Nations, quote, defense is of much more importance than opulence. Okay, so I think you're right. Like he's kind of almost admitting this isn't going to be efficient, what I'm about to propose here. Like it's going to make us poorer. But it's better to be poor and safe rather than, you know, right. rich right. and then we get conquered by the Chinese or something. And right. so anyway, how do you how do you want to address that? Well, I'm not an expert on global warming, but I read experts on it. And the two that I go to, I did a review of his book, Stephen Coonan, who had been at Caltech, mm -hmm. wrote a book called... Um, Oh my God. It's one word. And, uh, uh, are we doing charades? <laughs> How many <laughs> syllables? <laughs> uh, anyway, it, it'll come to me, but basically he goes through and looks at the IPCC reports mm -hmm. from the UN and points out where they exaggerated and they kind of admitted that they exaggerated and so on. And so it's just way less grim. The other one who's kind of taken this on and he's just a very good researcher, is David Friedman, Milton's son. Mm -hmm. and he's done a few very good pieces on his substack that go after this. So I couldn't get into it in some detail, but I just did tell the reader to you know take a look at, at these things uh, because it's just not the case. Well, it could be the case, but the probability is extremely high that we're going to have a... a, a a slow increase in temperature over decades with lots of time to adjust. And the other thing that I think it's David Friedman points out is we are in a what's called a little ice age. In other words, we are in a kind of a cold part of the cycle if you look over many centuries. And so we could go up a little and there's not a big problem. Yeah, just on that, because as you know, David, I for a while uh, in my career, spent a lot in this area. Yes. And, uh, you know, my my favorite, you know, talking point on this, just to kind of get people to shake them and say, you don't understand the chasm between what the, you know, activists are saying that, oh, this is, you know, we're just following the consensus science versus what the peer-reviewed literature says. And it's not enough to just ask some chemist hey, you know, how much do you think the global temperatures will go up over the next blah, 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 and then from that to be able to back out what appropriate government policy is. Right, Because right. the chemist doesn't know anything about how taxes work, and, you know, they I mean, so it's yeah. a separate thing. So it was this, I don't know if you remember this, Dave, this literally the same weekend when, William, when it was announced that William Nordhaus was getting the Nobel Prize for his pioneering work on the economics of climate change, the UN released its special report on on 1.5 degrees Celsius as a target to limit, yeah. you know, global warming to that amount. Yeah. And I just pointed out Nordhaus's own model that he just won the Nobel Prize for, or the memorial, everyone knows, you know, yeah. um, showed that that the 1.5 C target was so draconian that would hurt humans more than if governments did literally nothing about climate change. Yes, and, and, you and, and yet, yeah, yeah, and and that didn't come up in the New York Times, and I was 
upset with Nordhaus because the New York Times report when they're interviewing him, you know, they're running the stories like together because it was yeah. topical. Said, hey, do you, you know, Professor Nordhaus, do you think there's a chance that we can still hit the 1.5 C target? And he just said something like, no, nah, that, you know, the horse is out of the barn. But he didn't say, and thank goodness, because that target's insane. He didn't say right. that. No, <laughs> he was he like, didn't. thank you, everyone, to invite me to your cocktail parties. And, and anyway. Yeah, um, no, that was bad. So there's did. that. Yeah. And, uh, and, was, and another thing, too, um, what's his name? The people, Orrin Cass, I know, is not a, a big popular person now in some circles. Um, but he did, he uncovered some great stuff. Like, yes, yeah, some of these models that, you know, people were coming and testifying to Congress and everything. And some of the ways they were showing, you know, how awful things would be with, you know, the slight global warming over time is they were looking at like, like, like predictions of excess heat deaths and like, oh, in this, in the US, you yeah. know, by the year 2080, if temperatures continue, blah, blah, blah. This many people are going to die. Yeah. And it was um, the way they were doing it is they would look like right now in a northern city, if there was a blip up in temperature, you know, they could see how many people, excess people died from heat deaths in the summer that year. And then they just extrapolated. Yeah. And what ended up happening was it was just like these models were showing, oh, if Philadelphia is as hot as Austin is, <laughs> then thousands of people are going to be dropping dead instead yeah. of saying they probably would install more air conditioning, kind of like how Austin, you know what I mean? Like, in other words, yeah. They were showing the mortality rate in Philadelphia in the year 2080 was higher than in Austin in 2022. Yeah. And it was yeah. like, no, I'm pretty sure if we have five decades to get ready for it, the people <laughs> in Philadelphia will be as good as the people in Austin right now in terms yeah. of dealing with heat, you know. So that just kind of just to show some of these, you know, catastrophic projections and things are just crazy when you start unpacking it. Yeah. And to take a, a local example, I live in Pacific Grove. We don't have air conditioning. I have no friends who I know of, and I've got many friends here who have air, none of them have air conditioning, um, because we get maybe 15 days a year when we'd really like it, and that's mm -hmm. just not enough. You know, we have fans and, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, um, but we would if the temperature here went up by, you know, 10 degrees more for 40 more days in the summer, we'd probably get it, you know? Yeah. Okay, so I think, you know, we're agreeing we don't need – the government. To, and again, I don't want to even make this concession, but if you really did buy into the, you know, the textbook negative external, okay, you, you would put it in place a carbon tax. Yes. You would right. not have people, you know, consulting with Brad DeLong about which industry should we subsidize and which should we, you know, curtail, right. you know, you would just say, okay, yeah, the market's not correctly taking into account the, yeah. the true social cost. And so put in a, a tax. Again, and that's not that I'm for that, but that's what you would do. Yeah. That's my disappointment because I think Brad DeLong knows that. And that's why mm -hmm. I don't get what's going on. I mean, I I will say this for sure. He used to be a good economist, and I'm, and he might even still be. It's just it's not showing in this article. It's not showing in much of his work. It's funny you say that because I somebody I won't name the person because you know he said it to me in, in confidence. But but back you know when, there was a period where I was going against Krugman and DeLong like daily, yeah. Yeah. and somebody mentioned to me on the set. They said, yeah, it's it's a shame because. Back in the day, you know, DeLong was kind of a heterodox, not that he was heterodox, but he was very sympathetic to reading, you know, history of economic thought, and he would read marginal figure. And he, you know, he wasn't like mad or rabid against the Austrians. He kind of could respect like, oh, yeah, they have their tradition over here. And, you know, yeah. I like them. You know, they were more nuanced than the Chicago guys or, you know, that kind of stuff. And not only that, but mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever read his review of James Scott's book, Seeing Like a State, where he gets... It's, it's the best review of Scott's book I've ever read, first mm -hmm. of all. And, and, and not just the best, but in absolute terms, it's very good. But he also gets kind of upset at Scott for not referencing Hayek, for not pointing out this is very Hayekian. Hmm. I don't think Brad would do that today. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So yeah. it, it, it may be that my fighting with him soured him. So these Austrians are nuts. <laughs> so maybe I am, uh, you know, I should be the change I want to see in the world. All right. What about <laughs> this next one? I don't even know what he means. I mean, I understand the words, but he said, there is the need to reorient the U.S. economy from coastal finance and plutocracy to middle and working class prosperity nationwide. So I, I'm assuming part of that means like how the financialization of the U.S. economy and how much, you know, and CEOs now get you know, 200 times the median pay of the, of the company. Whereas, you know, back in the 1960s, it was a much lower multiple. I think he has in mind stuff like that. And guys trading derivatives, you know, on wall street, yeah. that's not really yeah. helping prosperity all that much. So Eddie, what's your reaction to that sort of critique? That, first of all, I mean, I think people in St. Louis or Chicago and so on can get 
loans. So I don't see it. It's a coastal phenomenon. And I don't know what plutocracy means. Again, he doesn't ever say it, say, say what it means. Uh, I do think there's a lot of, you know, government regulation that's making us more of a, a crony capitalist economy. He might have that in mind. And that would be interesting. If, But again, he'd have to lay out what he means and he just doesn't. And even on its own terms, like you're right. So I, I think that is kind of what he's grappling with, but I would say, right. And so I do agree right now, there are cronies, you know, companies that benefit not because they correctly forecast consumer demand, but because they were in, you know, like how come Lehman went down? Well, because the guy in charge was an ex Goldman Sachs guy. That's probably, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that kind of thing, right. And so the solution to that is say, and that's why we need industrial policy where the government picks winners and losers. No, that's what you're actually complaining against, you know. Right, right. And certainly and the Inflation the, Reduction Act, for example, mm -hmm. has made a lot of winners. Um, but but I, I don't think he's against that, but but maybe he is. Maybe maybe this is code, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Blink twice, Brad, if you don't like the Inflation Reduction Act. <laughs> you know, I don't and, know. I don't yeah, know. And, now, you, I don't know if you would agree with me on this one, David, but I also think uh, to the extent... I like so I like uh, you know derivatives and thing and I think in a genuine free market there would be call options and futures contracts and that that would help coordinate intertemporal plans and would be beneficial yeah. um but I'm open to the idea that yeah, right now the financial sector is bloated and that's partly because of for example activist monetary policy I think if you just had you know a standard gold you know a gold standard or something like that and that you'd have fewer boom bust cycles and I could see that Wall Street would not be as big a component of GDP as it is right now. I agree with that. And even short of that, if you went back to a Greenspan type policy where you just say, okay, when you get in trouble like the 87 crash, just, you know, just have lots of liquidity, but don't try to pick winners and losers versus Bernanke in 2008 who picks winners and losers, that would mm -hmm. be better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so but again, so even to the extent that we can kind of say, yeah, there are some features of the modern world that we agree with you, DeLong. We don't like that outcome. Our diagnosis of so what's causing that would be, oh, it's some version of industrial policy, you know, or right. activist monetary policy that's causing that. Right. Okay, right. and then what about this last one? And third, Chinese the Chinese president announced a no limits partnership with Russia right before Putin invaded uh, Ukraine. So how do you feel about that? Don't we, and I don't know what is, is it an industrial policy? Like what, like cracking down on TikTok and not, uh, you know, build getting rare earths, you know, sourcing it from somewhere besides China. I don't, I don't I know exactly what he even means. I think that's probably what he means. And he's probably thinking about semiconductor chips, I would mm -hmm. guess, because Taiwan is so at risk. And by the way, I think Taiwan is at risk. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that might be what he's getting at. But the thing is, he's, talking as if they're more of a direct threat to us. And that's why I said in my response, the Atlantic and the Pacific are awfully handy. Like it's mm -hmm. very hard just to, to have a scenario, imagine a good, a plausible scenario where China invades us. It's very hard to have a plausible scenario where Russia invades us. It's even less plausible with Russia because their economy is, I, I'm going to say probably one eighth the size of ours at best. And, you know, it, it just, I don't know, it's just like it's hard to see what the scenario is where we're at risk in that sense. I mean, they're, they're not even able to subdue their next door neighbor. I mean, right. funded with our stuff. But if they try to take on the U.S. directly, we would fund our own defense, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. OK, you know, since you were at the post-naval school for so, I mean, can you naval speak of graduate uh, naval, naval postgraduate? <laughs> right. yeah. Can you um, yeah, I mean, you're as an economist, you know more about this kind of stuff than, than most economists would like, what's your thought just in general, you know, I've seen people like by some measures, the Chinese Navy has more tonnage now than the, U like the, you know, our ships are bigger or something like that. Yeah. But I I've seen things, you know, projections about, you know, yeah, it's not that if they went head to head and the, the Chinese are going to take over Florida next Thursday, but that if they did want to, you know, do something with Taiwan or Hong Kong or whatever that the U S is getting weaker and weaker. And that the, you know, the Chinese, if, if I were them, I would just bide my time and let the U S kind of implode. And they're just slowly, you know, and the, the belt road initiative and all this stuff. Anyway, we just, do you have any thoughts in general? Like the people that are worried about, let me put, this is my question. I, I realize I'm rambling, David. I think when, when Trump and guys, populist guys in the red get up and rail against, you know, the Chinese communists, 
There are some libertarian free market types who just roll their eyes and, oh, yeah, here we go again. And I'm wondering, you know, could both things be true that, yes, the Chinese are not our buddies, but yet, you know, tariffs don't do anything about that. And, you know, a, a non-interventionist foreign policy is still the right solution, but you don't need to be naive and just assume it's pure fear mongering to be concerned about the Chinese government. Right. So if I had friends in Hong Kong, I would worry about them. Well, I, I, I'd be already worried because they're right. being suppressed. Uh, if I had friends in Taiwan, and I did have a colleague at the Navy school, she and her husband are from Taiwan, and we talk about it occasionally. Um, so I'm concerned for them. So yeah, I think China is really, really p more powerful than they were, say, 20 years ago in that part of the world. But they're not, a, as you mentioned, Florida, they're just not a threat to us in any direct sense. So I was invited back in 2011 or 12 to give a talk on globalization to the newly, I'll say, christened <laughs> admirals, the one stars and some uh, senior executive service people. There were like 50 new admirals. And, and so... I started off with basically what's good about globalization, gains from trade, and worked my way into more and more controversial things. And I didn't go, I didn't get through the whole talk because I got to China. Mm -hmm. And they were so worried about China. But it's interesting because, uh, I mean, I still laid it out and we had a great back and forth. So I was in the kind of the equivalent of the green room waiting for the next session. And I was just going to be a, an observer. And the uh, the two star admiral who was running it kind of kind of said to me, um, "Well, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself." So we have this 15 minute break. The two star admiral gets up, and I know this had to be unprecedented. He said, "Before I introduce the next speaker, I want to just take on what the previous speaker said." <laughs> and it was and it was like it would have been inappropriate for me to put up my hand and, and argue, right? So I didn't. But then when I was in, quote, the green room after and we're talking, he said, now I get your point. We wouldn't like it if they were off, off the coast of Florida. And I said, well, you're right. We wouldn't. But that wasn't my point. <laughs> my point was they're not much of a threat, period. And uh, But what he had the idea of, and I've seen so many people in the U.S. military, and frankly, so many people in the U.S., this was one of my biggest shocks when I moved to the United States in 1972 from Canada, seeing that it seemed to me about 80% of Americans thought it was just right for the U.S. government to have a huge say about whatever is happening in the world anywhere. Yep. And it was just like, oh, my God, I've got an uphill battle here. And, uh, and it wasn't like I was this big non-interventionist, but I was enough of a non-interventionist not to want to have the government intervening all over the place, just in a few places like NATO. And, and so, um, yeah, that's, a, that's just this mindset that, that people have. Uh, I gave a talk about uh, to a bunch of farmers once about what should we be afraid of and what shouldn't we be afraid of. And my big one we should be afraid of was the debt and deficits. And what shouldn't we be afraid of is China taking over. And I showed a, a slide. Uh, it was, okay, we've got 11 aircraft carriers. How many do they have? And the slide said, aircraft carrier for sale because they bought a used one from Russia. You know, now mm -hmm. I think they've got two, you know. But anyway, they, uh, yeah, they just aren't a threat to us. In, in terms of like military invasion. Uh, military threat. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, and that's when I, when people ask me things, you know, and again, I'm not an expert, so I, yeah, you know, I'm talking more like casual conversation. I try not to say too much, you know, on a podcast where Brad DeLong later can say, aha, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But um, that, like, if they were, you know, they can just buy up, you know what I mean? Like, they could literally buy us instead of, you know, trying to invade us. And, like, that's the cool way they could take over in, in that sense, just, like, wait for our economy to, you know, fall relative to theirs and so forth that – it, it wouldn't or that's, go that, far from that though. No, but, I don't mean that they literally own the U S but I'm just saying like, yeah. in terms of if I were worried about Chinese infiltration, I would be worried. Like, are they secretly funding some, some senator's campaign or something? You know oh, what I mean? See, yeah. Not, are they literally getting ready to land, you know, in Texas? Right. right um, yeah. Just on your point there, David, about how Americans just take it for granted that no, I mean, the U.S. president cannot opine on anything on planet Earth. That's kind of our, our sandbox. As we're, you know, railing against, oh, my gosh, 
Maybe someone in Russia paid Lauren Chen some money to get Tim Pool to say some story. You know, that's where they're yeah. meddling with our election. People go look up Time Magazine had a cover story called Yanks to the Rescue, and it has like a caricature of Boris Yeltsin. And the whole story is about how, you know, we were quiet about it at the time, but, you know, the U.S. intervened to make sure Boris Yeltsin got reelected and yes. you know, giving money, sending advisors, doing all kinds of stuff. And, but they were, again, they were quiet during the election about what they were doing because they realized Yeltsin's opponents could say he's a, 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 a U.S. stooge. Yeah. And so that's why it was all secret. And now we're just openly bragging about it. Like, yeah, we we yeah. helped make sure that the right guy won the Russian election because you know how those Russians can't be trusted to pick the right leader for themselves. Right. And yet we're now, you know, oh, I can't believe someone would have paid money to Lauren Chen. Anyway, it's just yeah. shocking the hypocrisy and people are like, well, no, because we're the good guys and Russia's the bad guys. What, what's yeah. your point? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Or Ukraine in 2014, you know, trying to help change that government. Yeah. And that's something that even there, like I'm rusty on the details, but yeah, a lot of this stuff, people just don't know the, yeah. the basic facts. Um, yeah. Okay. So as, as we're winding down here, David, I guess, uh, are there any major things where you think that, yes, something major needs to happen in terms of a change in, in policy or else this bad thing X is just going to fester, but it's the solution's not, you know, industrial policy, the solution is something else? Or do you actually think that, no, it's, you know, the world's never perfect, but things are basically just, you know, we keep trudging along here. Well, I, no, I think the big ones are the debt and deficits. I think I, I, I am stunned. Well, I'm no longer stunned because I'm so used to it mm -hmm. at how the two major candidates don't care. Yeah. They don't care. They're both bragging. Okay. Well, first of all, Kamala Harris lies and says Trump wants to cut Social Security and Medicare. And Trump tells the truth, which he doesn't want to cut Social Security and Medicare. So implicitly, she's saying she doesn't. Mm -hmm. And those are two of the three or four biggies that you have to cut or cut the rate of growth of substantially if we're going to avoid this real mess in the next decade. And... Uh, you know, it's just like they're not taking it seriously. I had a lot of problems with Nikki Haley, especially on foreign policy, but she was the one candidate, if I recall correctly, who did try to talk about the debt and deficits, and uh, it fell on deaf ears. Can I ask maybe the last question here on that is, um, is it possible, I, I recently did the the people at The Reason, what is it called, Just Asking Questions, they had me on, and they were playing some clips of the, uh, like these deficit commissions or whatever. Yeah. Is it possible, David, that some of those things, they were uh, a bit, the, it's like the boy who cried wolf kind of thing, that they were a little bit too apocalyptic 10 years ago. And so now it gives ammunition to someone like a Stephanie Kelton to say, they've been warning us our whole lives that we better reform social security in the next five years and we're all dead. And look at how low treasury yields are right now. Give me a break. Yeah. I don't know if people were that apocalyptic. Um, I was pretty careful. Um, and I, and Jeff Hummel and I've written about it. He was pretty careful. I, I don't know. And I don't, uh, I just don't recall. Um, but I do remember as recently as four years ago, I've been writing a, an article either every two weeks or every three weeks for Hoover's defining ideas. It's an online thing since around 2000, late 2018. And I took on uh, not uh, Larry Summers and Jason Furman, who were saying, yeah, you know, we can borrow more because in interest rates are so low. Yeah, if they remain low. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, <laughs> these are smart people, but it's like, why would you assume interest rates are going to remain low? It just, and I don't mean that I knew they were going to rise, but why would you assume that that one price wouldn't rise? You know, I, I don't right. think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's probably a good spot to wrap up. My guest this week's folks has been David R. Henderson. And you got to have the R because there's another David Henderson economist we like to distinguish. Uh, Although, by the way, he died a few years ago, unfortunately. The British oh, guy. Yeah. I, did. I was not aware of that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, okay. sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, still, you're the alive one. And yeah. uh, and so, David, for people, if they want to get on your sub stack, is there a play, way they can do that easily? You can tell yeah, them? Yeah, David R. Henderson sub stack, and also I call it, I blog to differ. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. yeah. So, yeah, so great stuff. I always look forward to getting that. David, thanks so much for your time and your insights. Thanks, Bob. 
Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human okay. Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org. Mises.org.